thank you very much, and thanks for hanging out with us. You know, when I started doing this work in 1983, we could have that conversation at a table for four. And so, thank you. And so the, I am so satisfied, excited, I mean, just moved to almost tears. The depth of the conversation, the commitment that you all have, it's extraordinary. And, you know, for the first 20 years I was alone, and now we're all going together. So this is uh, going to be an amazing conversation with an amazing client. I'm so honored that Whirlpool's been a client for many years. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the power of and. So um, Whirlpool's vision, and by the way, there are a lot of words. There's vision, purpose, ESG, whatever. Just understand what your objectives are, who your audiences are, and the outcomes that you want to have whomever you're talking with, because the terminology has gotten a little bit muddy. But Whirlpool's vision is to be the best kitchen and laundry company in constant pursuit of improving life at home. That's the power of and, and I know that Pam's gonna talk about, you have to have the business and the products and the operations and then the, the and, the society, the environment, and all of those um, elements. I always like to start my podcast, so any of you, okay, show of hands. How many of you listen to Purpose 360? Come on, let's get more, I, it's, my, it's my passion project, thank you. Well, today, I have a wonderful conversation with Pam and her colleague, Deb O'Connor, that launches today on Purpose 360. You're gonna love this conversation, but you're gonna love that even more, because it's longer. But let's just talk about context for a bit. Whirlpool, a little, little bit about their size, 76, thousand employees, 22 billion in revenues, a company that's 111 years old on 1111 this year, which I think is pretty cool. Now let's just talk about Pam. Pam's an amazing individual. She's been with the company 29 years. Oh no, stop that. And <laughs> she's an engineer by training. And she is very proud. She has three patents, one for a removable agitator, but one of her most in beloved inventions is the steam dryer. And so anybody that's, yeah, Rachel's going, yeah, that's really cool. Woo, we love the steam dryer. Um, and, and at the cocktail party, ask her about how she came up with the solution, because it was amazing. Under her leadership, when she was leading the laundry team globally, she had 400 engineers that she was working with, which is extraordinary. Um, she's also led the development of Whirlpool's $63 million technology um, center that is being built right now um, in Benton Harbor, their home headquarters. And she says she's got all of the E in ESG, she's got half of the social impact and none of the G, huh? And I think that you'll get the G one day because everybody loves how wonderful you are. So let's start out. As a child, so you know, we all think about what impacts our careers. So as a child, Pam wanted to be the second baseman of the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> Woohoo! All right? But it, it didn't quite work out. So Pam, can you just talk a little bit about your career progression over those 29 years and how it's put you in an amazing position to be the head of sustainability and corporate relations at Whirlpool? Once I failed that whole baseball thing. Right, yeah, yeah well, okay. you know, hey, you gotta fail to win. Yeah, so the important lesson out of not making it in Major League Baseball was I was taught by my parents, I can kind of do whatever I wanna do if I work hard enough. So I did go into engineering. I actually was thinking of medical school. My dad informed me that he would pay for four years of school. That was it. I might wanna have a degree I could use afterwards. Engineering worked out great. I hired into Whirlpool right out of undergrad. That's important as you think about the 29 years. Um, into a wonderful rotational engineering program. Spent about seven years in engineering and then from that point on really went back and forth between business facing roles, um, marketing P&L ownership roles and also uh, continuing leadership roles in engineering and ultimately in January of this year was put in um, to a newly expanded role uh, on our executive committee where I have corporate communications globally, I have government relations, um, I have a couple of other cats and dogs I would say uh, within communications is our corporate social responsibility and then I also, uh, they added sustainability to that role and elevated that to the executive committee level as well. So that's wonderful and I bet you would all love to have that background in that role. 
um, when I was interviewing Pam, you know, I said, what do you really love about your job? And she says, it brings together so many aspects that you care about. So can you share with us some of the wonderful initiatives that Whirlpool is uh, undertaking? Yeah, and, and one reason I was put in the role, despite having a, a, a background that isn't so obvious, is that I care about the community. I've been involved in a number of efforts in our local community, as well as other communities around the world, uh, depending on what role I was in. And that's something I'm incredibly proud of, and our company's incredibly proud of, the heritage that we have. We were founded in St. Joseph, Benton Harbor, Michigan, and our, head, our global headquarters is still there. But if you look at all of our communities around the world, we've had a deep impact. And so this was an opportunity to continue with that impact. Also, product is my true love at, at our company. And there was a lot of continued work to be done in the product space. And I felt like I could bring that uh, to the future initiatives. We're also driving some great efforts uh, in the CSR space around our racial equality pledge and really understanding how we can get that right ultimately. We've got 18 work streams within that space, nine internal facing, nine external facing um, that are deeply focused on and, and on the right things um, and sponsored by our CEO with a, a lot of ownership there. Uh, and then we have a 23 year partnership with Habitat for Humanity uh, that my colleagues that are here with me own for us. And if you could think about the best partnership for a company like ours to have, it is Habitat. Uh, it fits so perfectly with what we call our house and home strategy. And we're, you know, with this partnership, um, we've evolved into building two, now signing up for 250 climate resilient homes. So if you think about these individuals who are not able to afford these increasing energy bills, their homes are going to be at least 15% more efficient. And I think what's even more important, we have a picture that shows five, the five homes that were left standing after Hurricane Michael were our climate resilient habitat homes. So not only are we creating a space that's more efficient for these um, families to, to move into and we donate a refrigerator and range for every habitat home that's built, but these homes are going to withstand the test of, of time and weather as well. And can you talk a little bit more about the work in Benton Harbor with your equality pledge? Sure, absolutely. As I mentioned, we have 18 work streams. Um, it's everything from we built a, a multifamily housing unit. We saw, like many of you, I'm sure it's difficult to recruit talent. And housing was a big barrier for that, available housing within our community. And we weren't seeing developers step up. So we said, OK, we'll spend $22 million and we'll create a great housing community with dual purposes. One, housing for new employees or even existing employees, but also we're earmarking a percent of those, those units for what we call community heroes. So Benton Harbor has, has a lot of need in the community, and so we want policemen, firemen, school teachers to be able to have subsidized rent so they can be in these apartments and also we can create a community within the community to start so these individuals interface and start to understand what each other are facing day to day. We have other work streams around mentorship. We have internship work streams, apprenticeship work streams to really introduce the community to Whirlpool and figure out how do we best help. Uh, another activity that's been critically important is, is improving some of our public parks. Uh, and we learned a big lesson on yeah. that, as you know, Carol. We went in there two years ago and said, we're gonna clean this up, we're gonna fix it up, we're going to fix your dugouts. This was a, a, a very uh, legacy-filled park where a lot of adults and, and leaders in the community remember playing softball and baseball as kids. We went and did that, and it got destroyed. Um, graffiti, uh, a, a lot of destruction, so we said, what did we do wrong? And sat down with community leaders and members of the community to say, we thought we were helping, but we didn't listen and we didn't engage them. And so the team went back this year side by side with these community leaders and members of the community and refixed it up in the way they wanted it. Mm -hmm. And it's been incredibly successful. So the lesson of learning um, and listening and learning what they want rather than just showing up as the great hope and, and investing. Yeah, I'm really glad you, that you shared that fail because from that fail and being very candid because we're not, we're on an expedition, I love that. And I love the fact that, oh, there's a chasm, we're gonna fall down and such because that happens. But one of the great tenets of Whirlpool is the listening. Um, and I also know that from your engineering background that you were very, you had critical skills that you would apply and solutions 
Um, so, so that's really wonderful. How do you scale globally? Because this isn't just the U.S. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. That's one of the benefits of our company is, is, is we are, uh, we have global operations. And so Europe for us is obviously a leading indicator of re what regulations might be coming either directly to the appliance industry or, or in other spaces. So that helps us. Um, India is on a month in a much different place. Brazil is somewhere in the middle. So what's been great is our regional leaders are saying, hey, help us understand what our total goal is for Whirlpool and what role we need to play in that. And to be honest, quite often the regions are thinking, we got our agenda, we don't need corporate. In this case, they understand the bigger picture and the need to be a part of it and they're very open to it. So we need to provide a direction and make sure we're not asking for 100 initiatives, but we're asking for the four big things that really matter and those four might look a little different in Europe than they do in India and that's okay. But you also have Habitat as a global partner. Right. Yep, yeah. we do have Habitat as a global partner and we're scaling that differently. It's been a huge presence in the U.S., but we see big opportunities around the world and, and we just sponsored a global build with them at, absolutely. Yeah, and they call it the, the world tour. Yes. Uh, yes, yep. of, of yep. building. And if any of you have built a Habitat house, it's transformational for you and your employees. So I strongly suggest that you do it. Um, I, I would say that um, you have a very unusual role. You've been in it for about 10 months. Um, are there any key learnings that you can share with our colleagues here about how to be successful in the role, especially embedding it, because it now reports into the C-suite? Yeah, I, I'm sure you all have had similar learnings, and I've heard it talked about a lot here. It has to be enterprise-wide. It can't be that this little sustainability or ESG team is working on this and everyone else goes about their daily business, and that was one reason for elevating the role and also someone with my background going in there because I... I've been in manufacturing, I've been in engineering, I've worked with procurement, and, and it, it has not been difficult, to be completely honest, for these functional leaders to understand the role they need to play. They're looking for some direction, but they get that for Whirlpool to, to continue to be successful into our next 111 years, they need to play a critical role. They're putting resources against it as we explain why that's important, et cetera. So um, it, for me, it's been all about an enterprise-wide initiative, and it, We've been fortunate with the, the reception to that. And I'd love you to tease, you've got some future products that are in development and having an engineer that's tied into sustainability makes it very interesting to work with underrepresented markets. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what you're looking for without telling everybody what you're doing? I'll try. Okay. Uh, so we do have some interesting things going. Obviously, electrification looks very different uh, around the world. And so um, the, the adoption of our appliances or the ability to buy appliances is very different de depending on where folks live. So there's a big underserved need. And doing laundry is still a very manual task in some regions where we're present. And so we're looking at opportunities to take electricity out of it a little bit but create a, a, an easier way for people to complete the tasks um, that are quite honestly taking up their entire day and keeping them from spending time with their family and doing the things that, that they would much rather do and, and love and enjoy. And, and that's a role we play in every home around yeah. the world, but that's an important role we can play in developing countries where we actually have a big presence as well. So we don't need to wait till they can buy what we already have. We can help improve their lives with something different. And I know that when Tanya was talking about being, a, she's a cultural anthropologist, mm -hmm. that that really struck you. And can you share a little bit about being in the homes of a consumer or a user um, with a Whirlpool appliance? Yeah, absolutely. So I was fortunate in some of my early marketing days, especially we were launching some, some very different products here in the U.S. And so we were in consumers' homes. We had given them product to test. It was a, a, a dramatically larger washing machine that actually used 64% less energy and 63% less electricity than what we had at the time. And what, what these consumers loved was the capacity. It was huge. And they could wash a king-size comforter. They could wash three loads instead of one. And I remember talking to a number of them, but this one mother in particular said, because we give them the product, they test it for six months. It is, isn't branded. There's some finishing touches to put on it, so we, we don't leave it with them. We end up selling them on at a dramatically reduced price later. She didn't want to part for it, for any part of her life now. She was used to this. Said, no, you can't take it. You can't take it. Um, I love this thing, and it's changed my life. It's changed and my life. And for me, that really hit home. You think appliances, you think it's not so sexy. 
doesn't need to be sexy. We're, we're giving people time back to do the things they love. And for me, that's been critically important throughout my career. So Pam, we are, I can't believe how fast that went. We're, we're out of time. One last word that you'd like to leave with the group. Yeah, I, I think we've talked all day about purpose. What's great, I just talked about our purpose. Um, Carol said it in the eloquent way of, our, of our, our, our vision and mission, but really just help your employees connect what they do every day with um, how to improve people's lives is the way we say it, uh, and you'll get people to move mountains for you. Great, thank you. Thank you.